In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and lived among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so I wanted to cover a couple of things here. He talks about as many as received him. To them he gave power to become the sons of God. This has to be what I believe to be the most misused scripture in the entire Bible. There are many people who believe that they're going to heaven by some simple decision they have made. It's a common preaching these days. It's called the sinner's prayer. They essentially come to you and they have this prayer where they tell you to confess your sins. And then you ask some sort of form of asking Jesus into your heart. And then you thank him for paying for your sins. But I wanted to go over this verse right here because that's not at all what this verse is teaching. So the support for that kind of a doctrine is not found here. In fact, that doctrine is not found in the Bible. And when we come to the judgment seat of Christ, what the Bible says is what will matter. What the Bible says is what we will be judged by, or what we will be saved by, if we are to be saved. So let's review. Verse 12 again, but as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so what is he teaching us here? He's talking about being born, but not being born of the flesh. So in John chapter 3, Jesus said, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And again he says, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So he says here in verse 13, Which were born not of blood. He's talking about those that were born again as in going to heaven, that they've been saved from their sins. So it says here, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So this new birth also is not of the will of man. And yet, it seems Sunday after Sunday, that's what we teach, right? that man is born with free will, and that by his will, he will choose to save himself. It's very common. People pretend as if that's not what we're teaching. But here, the Word of God teaches very, very differently. But of God. So this new birth is something that takes place as a work of grace in the heart. Now this gift is upon the worst among us. This gift is for the lowly, for the broken.
And another thing I wanted to point out from verse 12, as many as received him, so those that have received him, this is a verse that is translated, accept him, very commonly today. To them he gave power to become the sons of God, is what the Bible says. So if you've become saved, if you've been born again, as the scripture is referring to here, you will have power to become a child of God. So the Bible says if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All things are of God. So also, if you have experienced this true salvation, this saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, you will be a new creature. You will be changed. The things that you want will change. The things that you are will change. I know this to be true. I was saved in a prison cell. Many people have the wrong perception of me. They think, who is this man to speak to me? Look like I haven't had many problems. I've had problems before Jesus. I was saved in a prison cell. It was not my first time there, not my second time there. If you count the juvenile system, it was probably around 11 or 12 times in and out. That was my destiny because I was a criminal. I like to steal. I like to do drugs. I like to take advantage of people. I like to go and be a womanizer. Lots of things I did, and for this I suffered. For this I suffered. I remember the last time, it was a particularly bad time, because everybody left me. Everybody from my family abandoned me. I crossed the line. You know, the, the, the time I went to jail before that, there was commissary. This time, no commissary. This time, no visit. My family abandoned me. My girlfriend left me, abandoned me as well. The court system turned on me. All they wanted to do was terrify me and warn me of the 10 years in prison to come. I had no one and no one to turn to. And it was then for the first time that a man came to me with the word of God. I sat there puzzling all night. Why was he there to speak to a man like me? Doesn't he know what type of person I am? I knew what type of person I was. Apparently he didn't. And I couldn't figure out why he would spend his time coming into that jail to speak to scum like me. It haunted me. I thought about it all night. About how wicked of a person I am. I found no rest in my spirit. The only time I felt any bit of comfort from the crushing weight of the world around me was when I was reading the Word of God. You see, my family was not there for me. My girlfriend was not there for me. The court system was not there for me, but Jesus was there. He was there. The presence of Christ in that room. The peace of the presence of God. I remember I couldn't look at myself in the mirror when I first came to read the Word of God. It didn't have an immediate effect. Immediately I began to have this mounting sense of guilt about my sin, about the things I was doing. I couldn't look at myself in the mirror. The only thing I could utter was, God, I can't be me anymore. I can't be me anymore. He saved me there in that cell. Now I don't have to go to jail anymore. I don't have to go to prison anymore. Because he's delivered me from me. He saved me from me. And I couldn't imagine a better gift. I swear the churches, they rob the people of the knowledge of this gift. The gift of grace for the chief of sinners. I know what I was. They could tell me all day about their free will, about how they made themselves righteous. I know what I was. I was a wicked man. And there when all I had was tears and guilt and sorrow and the word of God, 
All I could think was, God have mercy on me. I knew I was suffering because of my sin. And I knew there was more suffering to come because I was a great sinner. All I could think was, God, I need mercy. Have mercy on me. That's all I could think was to be free from this burden of guilt. To be free from me. It was there in that prison cell that for the first time in my life I was set free. To know the joy of the Lord for such an unworthy being such as myself. You know, he answered my prayer. He answered my prayer. He answered my prayer. It was God. Don't let me be me anymore. Save me from me. Because he changed me. He changed who I am. He changed the way I think. He changed the things I want. He's put in my life a love for the Word of God. And this is not me at all. This was not my life. I was addicted to drugs. I was addicted to heroin. I was addicted to heroin. I used it intravenously. And I know the statistics that those who use heroin don't stop. Not till they're dead. I know the statistics for people in my condition. I was addicted to heroin, hopeless to stop. It was gone the day that Jesus Christ came. It was gone. Before I remember, I didn't want to be a thief, but I had to steal because I needed money. I needed to get high because I was sick. I didn't want to be a liar, but then when my family would ask me about what I'm doing, I would have to lie because what I was doing was so rotten I couldn't be honest. I was such a slave. I was a slave to drugs, to addiction. Worse yet, my own evil heart. I was a slave to sin. And that's why I know the power of God is able to set people free, that there's liberty. The Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there's freedom. So no matter who you are or what you have done, there's mercy found at the cross of Jesus Christ for you. That is if you're a sinner, because Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. But Christ died for the ungodly. And you know, the Bible teaches me that's the reason that I was saved in that prison cell. To show you the glory of God. To show you the testimony of a changed life. To show you, you don't need to be what you are. You don't need to suffer. God would reach into that prison cell to save a wicked man like me. To show his love. The Bible says that Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. And so Christ has laid down his life for his friends. That's what he told you. I no more call you servants. I have called you friend. That's what it is to be restored unto Jesus Christ. That's the ministry of Jesus Christ. It is a ministry of reconciliation. It says that God was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses onto them, but taking the handwriting and the law and the ordinances that was against us and nailing them to his cross, thus making peace. That means that as Jesus says, he that believes on him is not condemned. But he that believes not is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come to the light. This is deeds should be exposed. 
And so we already began this message explaining that Jesus is the light. Jesus is the light of the world. And God has given a law written with the finger of God, the law of Moses. And many people believe that the law has passed away, but Jesus says that one jot or one tittle of the law will in no wise pass away to all be fulfilled. Jesus said, do not think that I've come to destroy the law. I've not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the law of God. And this law, written with the finger of God, you're probably familiar, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. We're familiar. But the Bible says that this law was not given for a righteous man. It's not given as a set of instructions for a good man to follow. But it says that the law was given for sinners. The law was given for sinners. The Bible also teaches that sin gets its power from the law. That because God has said, thou shalt not steal, we're drawn to it. Because God, God said, thou shalt not covet, we lust. We're driven towards our desires, towards our lusts, like fierce animals. But there is freedom from this condition. There is freedom and there is mercy because that's what it's about. It's interesting on the cross, Jesus was there and crucified with him were two thieves. One on his right hand and the other on his left. And he said they both mocked him as they were on the cross. And eventually one of the thieves came around and he addressed the other thief and he said, Do you not now fear God, seeing we are in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, we receive the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. So even he saw, even he saw it, even he saw it. And that's the truth of the law of God. That's the truth of the law of God, is that Christ suffered. Christ was crucified. And the third day he rose again from the dead. Now he was crucified and suffered a criminal's death. He wasn't only crucified, he was also tortured first and beaten and mocked. It said the guards, where they brought him, they kneeled before him, worshiping him. Hail, King of the Jews. They dressed him in purple clothes and mocked him. He died a criminal's death. Why? Well, Jesus said that no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. I lay it down of myself. And so Jesus willingly went forward, suffering a criminal's death, that we could have mercy, that we could be set free, that we could know that gift of grace and truth, that we could be saved. That's how God can have mercy on sinners like me. That's how God can pass over the law or the handwriting that is against us. It's because he has fulfilled the law. He has been crucified as an innocent. Without spot, without blemish, without sin. So that he could be the perfect fulfillment of the law for those that believe. So when he says, whoso believeth not is condemned already, it's because there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. There's no other solution to the law of God. Many religions around the world, they pursue the law of God. They build their religion about the law of God. But Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of this law. And because of his righteous sacrifice, because of his righteous blood, we can have mercy. We can know him. 
That's what he says in John 17, that this is eternal life, that they might know you, the only true God. You see, Christianity is not a faith in your mind. It's not something you convince yourself of. Not true Christianity. Believe me, there are many forms of Christianity that follow this path. Christianity is now and traditionally been known as revelation. It's Christ revealing himself to a man or a woman. If you become saved in this world, you will know Jesus Christ. You will have an assurance from God. You will not be left wondering, am I saved, am I not? And it's not simply because you've repeated a prayer. If you've become saved, you will be changed in your very nature. The Bible says that he's transited us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his marvelous light when we have become saved. So if you've become saved, not only will you know him, that is Jesus Christ, and you will walk with him as a friend. you will be a new creature. You will not be the same. This is a great gift for those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And I'll draw your attention there as we close. But Jesus did not say, blessed are the righteous in the statement on the Sermon on the Mount. He said, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So Jesus didn't have a promise there for those that were righteous, but for those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. So if you find within yourself an emptiness, a brokenness, a hunger to be different, to be a Christian, the Bible says you're blessed. And to take this desire and this prayer to Jesus Christ, just simply, Lord, make me righteous. Make me as one of your hired servants. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You see, there was two men that went into the temple to pray. It said one was a Pharisee and the other a publican. And it said the Pharisee stood and prayed like this with himself. God, I thank you that I am not as other men are, adulterers, fornicators. I pay tithes of all I possess, or even as this publican. And then the Bible said that the publican was standing afar off, but couldn't even lift his eyes to God. But he beat upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus, he said, I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. How simple. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The only thing that keeps us back is our pride, our foolish pride, when we can't even know how much help we're in need of. Friend, if you're in help today, turn to Jesus Christ. It says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. Know this, that you are blessed if you're in need today, and you need to turn to Jesus Christ to fill that need. You are blessed. You are blessed if you need to pray to him today, God, I need food. God, I need help. You're blessed. Many of the rich in this world, they walk by their busy day and they're cursed by God. Many people think they're blessed but they're cursed because they will never cry. They will never cry for mercy to Jesus Christ. They will never weep before him when he himself tells us to let your laughter be turned to mourning. Let your laughter be turned to mourning. But they will never mourn. The poor have a particular blessing. They have no one else. They have no one else. We live in a society in which men will not help you. No one's come to bail you out of this one. In this kind of condition, Jesus Christ is there but only for sinners. 
only for sinners. At our lowest point, that's where we find Jesus Christ. The sacrifice of God is a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Today, if you are crushed in spirit, turn to Jesus Christ and be set free. This brokenness is a blessing. This hurt is a blessing. Because we all need Jesus Christ. Many of us are too proud to ever see that. But if you're in need, it says that God fulfills all our needs. Turn to Him. The Bible says it is your sins that separate you from your God. That it is your sins that separate from you from your God. God demonstrates his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It goes even further. It says, for a righteous man, some might dare to die. Some might dare to die for a good man. But God shows us his love. He demonstrates his love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So his message today is, come unto me, all you who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and come and learn from me. My way is easy. My burden is light. And you shall find rest for your souls. What a great promise. How many of these people today, they're hungry, they're filled, they have a roof on their head. But they don't know rest. They don't know peace. They don't know the joy that can be found in Jesus Christ. For this, you don't need riches. into the highways, the hedges, bring in here the poor, the blind, the maimed, the halt, the withered, that my house may be filled. That is what Jesus said. He describes the kingdom of God being this way, that there are the religious and the righteous, and he invites them to the kingdom of God, and they say no. They say no, we will not go. And so he tells his servants, go out into the highways and to the hedges and bring in here the poor, the blind, the maimed, the halt, the withered, that my house may be filled because those that were invited will never taste of my supper. So God instructs his servants to go and to find the broken, to bring them into the kingdom of God that his gospel is for this people. Because those who think themselves worthy refuse. They refuse to know their need. But if you have need today, I'm sure you know it. And God knows it. Take it to the Lord. And God be merciful.